Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for spending your morning or afternoon with us to talk about uh, a practitioner's approach to model-based systems engineering. Uh, today, you can expect to learn uh, what an understanding of model-based system engineering is and why it's a natural fit for engineering design processes. Uh, we're going to talk about best practices for introducing MBSE into your organization and recommendations on improving time to value with MBSE deployment. And the audience really is for people who are interested in MBSD and how to deploy it, whether you're a manager or an engineer or a group of uh, people on a team that want to know where to start. Uh, we're really not going to be doing a discussion of tools today, so it's really not meant for people if you're trying to decide between uh, MBSD tools. So first, just the level set, everyone. Let's talk about why do we even need systems engineering, uh, much less uh, or, or even more importantly, model-based systems engineering. So let's say there's a farmer, right? And they need a way to chemically treat their field. And tractors and planes and helicopters all have limitations, but UAVs could be the right solution. But which configuration below is best for the farmer? And you see three configurations, right? One is a helicopter, one is a quadcopter, uh, and one is more like an airplane. And so if the question is, which one of these is the best one for the farmer to use and you don't know, then what do you need to know to know the answer to that question? And I'm sure if a few of you think about it, right, some of you will say, hey, well, first thing I need to understand is what the farmer's needs are, right? How much acreage are they covering? What's the weather like? Uh, what's the crop? What chemicals are used? How much money they've got? Where can they, do they have space to store the thing? Uh, and other people would say, well, hey, what about the specs for the UAV, right? Uh, sure, cost is important, uh, how long it can stay up, how much it can carry, uh, how stable it is. Again, thinking about the weather probably. And what kind of maintenance infrastructure is required to support these things as far as tools and uh, fuel and whatever uh, else they need. So um, clearly, to start to answer the question of which one is the right answer for a given farmer, you need to understand their needs and the specifications of the UAV. But in addition, you need to know how those things are related. So as an example, if the farmer needs a certain amount of acreage coverage, we need to know what that means in terms of flight time and capacity for the UAV spec. And uh, depending on the chemicals, how many, how heavy, that would go to capacity and probably flight time. Uh, budget clearly goes to cost and storage space ties to maintenance. So to really get the right answer, we need uh, to understand how, what the needs are, what the specs are, and how, the, how the, to relate those two at the system, subsystem, and sometimes even the component and at the component level. That's really what systems engineering is all about. And that, that movement from uh, needs to specs is really captured in the systems engineering V model. It's really the process for moving from needs to component specs to design through build and test and validation. That's what systems engineering is and what it's all about. In the past, when people implemented uh, system engineering processes, that V model was all document-based. The user requirements are captured in text models. The system specs are text. The uh, designs and specs are text. And you're moving all this text uh, documentation around in order to communicate uh, the state of the system that you're putting together. Um, what's happened over time is that the complexity of the modern-day systems that we have uh, and with computer-driven devices and things and the rise of computer-aided everything, right? Computer-aided engineering, uh, computer-aided drawing, drafting, computer-aided manufacturing. It's driving a move from document to model. And this is where uh, INCOSI, that's the International Council on System Engineering, has defined model-based system engineering is really the formalized application of modeling to support the process of systems engineering. And in this case, you'll see that we, we're just trying to visualize it as you see the system engineering, V, waterfall, uh, and now, instead of the document sort of being the heart of the process, the model repository is the heart of the process. And then to generate documents, you pull the information out of the model via report generator. Let's take a, a reason why this model-based system engineering approach seems to fit so well with uh, current engineering processes is that engineers are already trained to think visually and work visually, right? An engineer typically is creating diagrams of whatever it is they're working on. And those things are very useful for system engineering. So here's an example that we put together of a spacecraft. And it's basically a block diagram of a spacecraft uh, that has some really good information on what the subsystems are. You'll see there's a structure subsystem and harness subsystem, 
communications, avionics, propulsion, uh, guidance, navigation, and control. So we've got all the subsystems. Uh, we've captured the interfaces between those systems uh, and subsystems. So you see, in the case of command and data handling, there's connections to communications and to the payload uh, and also to uh, guidance, navigation, control. And we've also identified key functions and data exchanges. So uh, over on the payload side, right, there's a payload sensor whose job it is to sense thermal emissions. And there's a thermal, uh, the signal processor whose job it is to process the signal. So we capture a ton of information already with these diagrams. But when it comes to uh, text-based, document-based systems engineering, the traditional approach, these diagrams are just pictures. Uh, and they're used to enhance the documents, which are the master. So in this example, uh, let's say we've got an interface control document where we're trying to document all the interfaces between the subsystems uh, in our spacecraft. And uh, now we want to include this diagram. Well, we pretty much just cut and paste it as a picture into the document. And the document is the master that you're going to refer to and uh, version control and maintain. In contrast, the model-based approach, the diagrams are actually models that are captured by an underlying data model. And the data model is the master. And then any documents and other views that you want to have, they're generated from the data model. And that is a big difference, right? Because now, uh, instead of the text document being the master, you're doing everything in text. You're doing everything with your model and then generating uh, the formats and views that you need. And the benefits uh, of MBSC, just using this interface control document as an example, just imagine the difference between when you're trying to, say, verify the completeness of your interface control document, uh, either visually or with a text document, right? When it's visual, you can look at it. You can see, hey, we missed an interface between the propulsion system uh, and the uh, and the avionic subsystem, right? Imagine trying to do that with a text document, trying to look and see which interfaces are missing. Uh, also, when there's a mismatch, when it's in a model, you can start even, you can do it visually, but also you can validate it algorithmically. You can look to say, hey, uh, you know, the connection between uh, the um, avionic subsystem and the guidance navigation control system is a uh, command and telemetry link that's the same as the ones connected to the payload. Well, then the specs for those should be the same. And you can validate that algorithmically, again, between versus doing manual text comparison. And the another example is when you're doing additions and modifications. Uh, every time you make a change to a subsystem or add a subsystem, if you're in a text document, you've got to go walk through all the, all the places that that subsystem or interface appears in the document and check and fix it. Uh, in, this, in the model-based case, and I give a real simple example here, let's say that um, on the far left, I've got that model of the spacecraft, and I've decided that I want to add some more external uh, interfaces to it. So in, on the diagram in the middle, what I've done is say, well, I'm going to add a launch vehicle and its interfaces. Uh, the Earth environment, because there's some things around the Earth environment I want to capture, the space environment. There's also a ground station that communicates with the spacecraft. I want to capture that. Now, to get a new interface control document, I literally just push a button, and all those new subsystems uh, and system interconnections and interfaces are in the document and, and ready to be uh, used. If you're a believer in this stuff, right, the model-based system engineering, you say, well, how can I introduce it to an organization? And really the best practice with this is to really think about it as a large scale transformation effort. And uh, this company, SAMRAS Engineering, uh, has put up a very nice set of uh, guidelines around how to do this. It very much fits in with change management, uh, discipline, best practice. So, uh, and it's publicly available. So I, I copied it with pride. And you notice there's three steps are saying, hey, start from processes and practices, not from a tool. And how many times have we been uh, in one of these situations where we're going to introduce some new uh, technique to an organization, and the debate immediately moves to what the tool is going to be, right? This vendor, that vendor, you know, and all those questions versus what are the processes and practices that we're really trying to improve? And it goes right back to the focus on efforts reduction because you need to think about what you're trying to, what the benefit is going to be, what the benefits are uh, for doing this. And then in order to, you want to get some of those benefits as soon as possible. If the benefits are decades, years, let's say years away, it's hard to start down this large scale transformation effort. So these are just always good 
best practices, good advice on the right way to go at this. <clears throat> a lot of times you say, okay, well then I believe in this approach and I want to pick the right process or problem to start with. And a lot of times when people are introducing model-based system engineering, they'll think, oh, requirements management, that's a big deal in system engineering. It's the capture and tracking of text requirements. That's an important thing to do. Let's introduce model-based system engineering that way. Um, the argument here is that there's some issues with that because in order for you to do that, you've got to move all these requirements into the model-based system engineering tool. Then you have to create all the models needed to allocate these requirements. So there's no way to sort of gradually introduce MBSC as sort of all or nothing, which is, you know, again, when you're doing a large scale transformation effort, you kind of like to do things incrementally and start seeing benefits incrementally and grow from there. Um, there's lots of other tools also that handle text requirements. Fine, they don't do uh, model-based system engineering, but they do do text requirements management. So now you've got competition uh, in the tool space. And really, when you think about the pain around requirements management, because again, you're trying to think about where the benefits are going to be to the organization, there's pain in requirements management if people are using Word and Excel to manage requirements versus using the proper tool. But that's not to say that people need model-based system engineering. That's really to say that they probably need a, a requirements management process and tool. So we're saying that's probably not the right place to start from a business value standpoint. Our thought is and recommendation is to think of something like interface control documents, which we talked about and talked about the benefits of MBSE. I want to walk through them again, right? What are the pain points in a text-based uh, ICD approach uh, that are addressed by MBSC? Well, the interfaces are better understood visually versus textually, like we said. Uh, it's easier to interrogate uh, models as opposed to text documents. Uh, if you want to look for impacts of changes, again, you're querying the model versus reading through a document. Um, and again, these, all these diagrams that people are generating, you've got block diagrams and state diagrams and sequence diagrams. Um, in the text-based approach, you've got to manually compare. When someone wants to generate a state machine or a sequence diagram, uh, and it says something about the subsystem interfaces, you've got to now manually compare that to what the interface control document says. Whereas in model-based system engineering, all those models are in the model, in, in the database, and now you can, again, check them for how they're related. Uh, and lastly, and I'll show an example of this, uh, when you're creating different variations of ICDs, you, you want, maybe you want interfaces by subsystem, interfaces by component, uh, interfaces by protocol. You can, again, generate those at the push of a button versus trying to generate different versions of, of, of text documentation. And really the big thing here is that you can, with, if you're focused on interface control, you can start with whatever you've got. If you're at the subsystem level, you have subsystem information, fine, start that level. If you've got all the information at the system level, start with that. You can start lots of places. And again, very powerful from a change management standpoint. And just a, uh, the example I, I give you is, uh, again, this model that we've got. And we've actually done this. And by the way, I want to be clear that I'm not saying there's magic here. When you have your data in a model, it does require code uh, to generate these different outputs. Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying you, it's just magical. It just appears a push of a button. There's work that's required to make it happen. But again, uh, once it's set up, you literally can get these different views. This is an important slide, and it, it's got a lot of information on it. So I want to start on the left. So just in general, taking that uh, interface control example, put it in a broader context. If you're thinking about introducing systems engineering, uh, there's a text-based view and a model-based view. So let's talk about the pieces of system engineering. Uh, in addition to interface control, there's operational scenarios and things on the left uh, where you understand boundaries and lifecycle scenarios, and uh, capturing all the interaction interfaces. You've got the system architecture. Uh, you've got verification and validation that you do. And of course, requirements management. And if you think about it from a text-based point of view, if you're introducing text-based system engineering, you'd start where text-based gets you the biggest bang for the buck. Requirements management followed by verification and validation, then interface control, then operational scenarios because you can capture those with text. And the last thing would be system architecture because if you're text-driven, right, system architectures have to be captured with diagrams and models. Text-based probably you save that for last. If you're doing it from a model-based standpoint and you're looking to find out where to start and where to get those wins, it's almost the opposite. You really want to 
think about things like interface control, operational scenarios, and system architecture before you get to requirements management and verification and validation. Let's just give you, going back to that diagram of the spacecraft, if you notice, there is a scenario in here. Um, starting from the right side in the command and data handling subsystem, I basically postulated the scenario where uh, someone said, well, it's time to collect some data. So uh, there's a system command that goes over to uh, the payload software on the left to say, okay, time to collect some data uh, from the sensor. That leads to a command to turn on the sensor at the top left there. Uh, that data goes to the signal processor where it's processed and sent over to the right now. Uh, into command and data handling for storage, at which, and then later at some point, you process that data and send it to the communications system, subsystem for download. And compare that sort of very visual uh, approach of capturing this scenario where you can immediately see what's connected to what, how, where, when, versus you know the tech-based approach, which is you capture things in what are called use cases, and they're generally a list, like I just said, generate a command, activate a sensor, sense phenomenon, whatever, and you just have a list. So again, I'll leave you with the last point, uh, or as far as this goes, is that the benefits of using a model in this case are clear. And just to give you the takeaways, um, we really do believe that model-based systems engineering is a better way to use systems engineering for your project. Uh, if you want to introduce it, you need to think of it as a transformation in initiative. You are process first, not tool first. Look for where the pain is, the time when the business value is, and get some benefits early. And if you're looking for where those benefits are, make sure you're using a model-based, uh, not a text-based mindset to identify those quick ones. Thanks for checking out our channel. If you like what you saw, make sure to like and subscribe down below so you don't miss out on any new videos. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter for the latest engineering news and information. And to see all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at saratech.com events.